Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. So in this episode, I'm going to be talking about the process to write proposals as well as pricing jobs. But before we get into any video, as always, make sure you subscribe to the channel, like the video, and comment down below for any other ideas you may have for the Engineer Answer Series. This is a really important series where I try to address some of your questions and hopefully give you more insight on the engineering profession. You're subscribed. Let's get into it now that everybody's subscribed and has liked the video. So to begin, when looking at putting a proposal together, make sure that when you get the RFP or if a client asks you to put the proposal together, it's something that you have experience in. Now, uh, when you're putting the proposal together, you have to understand the subject matter. So let's say your design, it's a proposal to do an addition on a, on a school, let's say you've done a few of these before. My rule of thumb that I like to use is the 90-10 rule. 90% is, you know, matter or experiences you've done before. So let's say you have done additions to existing buildings before, let's say a mall or a plaza. You've never done a school before, so that's the 10%. 90% known, 10% is new. So like I said, you've done 90% is, you know, you've done an addition, uh, same number of stories, same number of floors on, let's say a plaza or a mall, something like that. You're being asked to put an RFP together for a school. Well, that's the 10%, learning how to deal with the different uh, infrastructure, different construction types, uh, that kind of thing. But let's say that uh, you've never done a, a masonry addition on a, on a school. Uh, well, then that's something I'd probably say, try to talk to people at your firm who have that experience, or maybe you might not be the best person to put that proposal together. You need to have experience in the subject matter that uh, is required or for the proposal. So once I've kind of vetted the RFP, I'll start to put a high level scope together. So what are we gonna need? We're gonna need to do some concrete design for the foundation. Uh, it's a steel, let's say a steel edition. So we're gonna have to figure out how we're gonna tie our, our bracing together, how we're gonna extend our shear walls, that kind of thing. Uh, and what, what changes we're gonna have to make, how much modeling we're gonna have to do to understand the previous structure and its implications and how we're gonna tie it together. Once I have everything kind of at the high level, so from the engineering side, the drafting side, the contracted man and, and site management side, then I'll kind of put everything together and I'll pass it to the team. I'll chat with you know some of the intermediate engineers or some of the, uh, the senior drafters or people who have had experience in kind of the similar projects so they could kind of poke holes at things I've missed because the key to proposals is to be extremely detailed to the point that you don't miss anything and you don't put your company or yourself at risk. The last thing you want is to miss something on the proposal, included something you probably shouldn't have and now you're stuck with it because from an ethics standpoint, whatever you put on the proposal is what you're submitting and that's what you should stand by at the end of the day. So whether it's a, a, something you've admitted in the pricing, so you might have admitted to do uh, uh, a drafting set that you've accounted for in your proposal, but your pricing didn't reflect that and that's why you won the job. Unfortunately, the ethical thing is to stick with your pricing and not ask the client for extras because it was your missing. So that's where the experience really comes in. You've done additions, you know what can go wrong, you know what will go wrong. Um, and then when you tie it into the school, maybe people of your firm have done that and, and they'll kind of give you some guidance. So, you know, at two jobs ago, we did the similar project and this happened. So we should probably include a little bit more budget here to handle those kinds of things. Or you simply omit them from your proposal. And that's something that's okay. However, you need to meet all the criteria that are requested in the RFP. I've said RFP a few times. If you don't know what it means, it means request for proposal. And that's essentially what you'll be answering to most of the time when you're putting a proposal. The primary issue I see with proposals is missing details. The key thing I tell anybody in my office who works on proposal is the devil is in the detail for proposals. Because like I said, the smallest little thing could cause the project to get out of budget and essentially cost the firm money. One thing to add is sometimes on projects you'll have a, a, an area like the 10% is something you have to do some research on. Typically what I'll do is I'll either, uh, let's say somebody else is talking to me about it or if I'm, I was working at a previous firm, I would say, okay, well we could allow for 10% learning and then that's an internal cost. So we can't pass that cost on to the client if that's something that we've never done. Uh, that's something that we typically take on internally and that's something you should always review with your VPs or your principal engineers as well as your project managers to essentially get approval prior to putting that into the proposal and hopefully changing the budget because that's essentially what you're going to be doing. You don't want to pass that cost on to the client or else you're just not going to be competitive. So now let's talk about pricing the project. So at my firm there's three different ways that we use. Other companies, other firms probably have different ways but we only use three different types. The first one is the bare bones type. We estimate how many hours for engineering, how many hours for drafting, how many hours for support, times the hourly rate, and that kind of gives us our budget. Um, because in most RFPs, you kind of are either asked for a hard budget or percentage of construction cost or uh, an upset limit. The most of the ones that we see around here are a hard fixed cost, and that's usually how we price it. Another common type is based on the square footage of the job. So let's say you have a 2,000 square foot building, 
Uh, here in Sudbury, you could assume 200 to 300 a square foot, depending on what you're building. Uh, in other places like Los Angeles, you're around 1,000 to 2,000 square foot, depending on what you're building. So you put that into perspective, and then you times that times a factor. Uh, so, you know, let 2% will be for mechanical design, 1% uh, for structural, or these are just arbitrary numbers, but your organization should be giving those to you. So for us, it's the Ontario Society of Professional Engineers. They have a standard guideline that we follow when we use this method. Uh, and there's also all sorts of guidelines and they all kind of average up to being the same thing. Uh, and then based on that, you kind of compare it to a rule of thumb of, uh, of uh, the hours that you're going to be using and it tells you if you're in the ballpark. That's usually the method I use the most, but that's because I have a lot of experience. This is a method that you should not be using if you don't have a lot of experience with construction numbers because you might end up extremely high or extremely low if you don't have that experience of knowing um, based on past experience. The last method is literally just using a past experience to dictate the price of a job. So let's say you've done a job for a, a foundation for a, it was a, let's say 2000 square foot house. Now you're being asked to do a 2500 square foot house. Well, take the cost you had initially and put a factor on that to get to that same square footage price. So it's a similar, similar way, but it's based on past experience that your firms had on projects. Because you know at 2,000 square foot, you were able to be profitable based on the previous budget. So then you just apply that same logic at 2,500 square foot, uh, and then you'll be likely within the ballpark and likely be successful, and you won't lose money. In terms of profit margins, uh, it all depends on what your firm's policies are, uh, and that's kind of internal to, to the company and where you live. Uh, different areas have different profit margins, and that's just part of uh, the supply and demand uh, part of engineering. But to always be careful, when it comes to pricing and putting proposals together, you should always consult with others who have experience. So that means your project managers, your VPs, and your principals. And always make sure to ask others in your firm, so ask your colleagues, ask your, your friends or, or anybody that you work with, and see if the numbers make sense to them. They might say, okay, well, this number seems high based on, you know, experience that I have. Again, depends on the size of the firm, how many people you have to bounce ideas off of. I'm doing a 10,000 square foot addition to a, a school, let's say, do these numbers make sense for, for contracting men, tendering, all, all that kind of thing. And if they don't make sense, just go back to the drawing board because based on their experience, it doesn't make sense and they probably should. So either you justify it to them, so either you could justify it to them. If you can't, that's when you should really look at your numbers again. So as always, thanks a lot for watching the video. If you have any comments or concerns about what I said, please leave it down below. I'd love to get this community going. Um, I love all the discussions that we've been having on the channel and I'd love to kind of keep growing the engineering community together. I find that the engineering community is a community that doesn't talk enough and they don't share enough information within one another. It's very selective, very not secretive, but it's very uh, secluded and I'd like to kind of change that. So as always, if you've enjoyed this, like the video, subscribe to the channel and yeah, leave it down below. If there's something that, you, that I've said that you don't agree with, great, leave it down below, we'll talk about it. And if there's something else that you want me to talk about, Please leave it down below and let's get the conversation going. Thanks again and I'll see you on the next one.